Amen. Amen. God is good. All the time. All the, time. God is good. the Lord is risen. He is risen <clears throat> it is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. Every time we come into the house of the Lord, we recognize that we have fallen short of the glory of God in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. Now is the time that we go before uh, our Savior with a silent prayer of confession. So let's take that quiet, reflective moment. Let's bow our heads and silently confess our sins to God our Father. Father, we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. 
We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. But we are heartily sorry for it, and we sincerely repent of it. And we pray that of your boundless mercy, you would forgive us for the sake and in the name of Christ Jesus, our Lord. It's in his name we pray this. Amen. Upon a true confession of our heart to God, I announce the grace of God to all of you, and I tell you, He forgives you all of your sins. He calls you sons and daughters. He declares you righteous in His powerful name. That is the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Whenever we gather together as God's people, it's also important that we confess who God is. We do that in our congregation through the recitation of a creed. So let us, as God's people, recite the one in true faith, as it is recorded in the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good evening, church. Good evening, Scott. Man, I like hearing that thunder in the distance. <laughs> uh, hey, is it on cue? Uh, was that? <laughs> yeah, it's making me money. Um, <laughs> so, uh, the other day, uh, in the evening time, I uh, walked out of my, the, the front porch of my house. It's like a little awning there. Um, and I don't, forgot what I was doing, but I was standing there, and all of a sudden, like a, you know, this, this uh, hummingbird just zipped up right in front of me and, a, and probably almost just out of reach, stood there hovering, looking straight at me. And I was looking at it, and it's looking at me. And uh, I said, hello there. <laughs> <laughs> and, he, and he just kind of looking at me, and, was, and, I was, and then, then I was just being stupid. Was, what do you want? You know? <laughs> and then the hummingbird flew right past my face over to an old hummingbird feeder that was empty <laughs> that we haven't used in years and was sitting there looking at, looking at the feeder, looking at me. I, was, I got it. <laughs> so I went inside, and I said, uh, honey, I got to fill up that, honey, that, that feeder. You know, where's the sugar? What do you mean? Well, the hummingbird just told me, about, oh, you speak hummingbird now. I, I said, well, isn't it obvious? Of course I do. You know? <laughs> and, uh, so now she's called me Dr. Doolittle in a loving sort of way. I guess. Uh, and, 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 you know, and the, but that right there, that's kind of, a, a, you know, what I did think about there. there. There's an old story about a farmer and swallows, but, but it, it was like, the, uh, you know, the hummingbird wanted something, and I was there, and I could hear the hummingbird. It's not true, I know, okay? okay. <laughs> but but this, it's like the hummingbird just needed somebody to listen to him, you know, and, uh, and to uh, take care of his needs. Much like we just need, that's all we need and as, as humans. We've just got this thing in us. We need to know that God hears us. We need to know that Jesus is our friend and that, that he cares for us and that we can talk to him, you know? And, uh, and he, that, that definitely is who Jesus uh, is to us. And uh, tonight, we're going to, together, as long as the lights hold out, <laughs> sing praises to his name and just thank him, thanking him for being our God. Amen. Amen.
that's drawing near when this darkness breaks to light and the shadows disappear then my faith shall be my eyes jesus has overcome and the grave is overwhelmed the victory is won he is risen from the dead and i will rise when he calls my name no more sorrow no more pain i will rise on eagle's wings before my god fall on my knees and rise i will rise and i hear the voice is good all the time, all the time. Amen. amen
Amen. You may be seated. God is good all the time. Do you guys go to church? Yes. Man, that's fantastic. What is the name of your church? That was terrible. That was terrible. <sighs> We're going to try this one more time. What is the name of your church? Brian's Road. Amen. I know, I know. If somebody says to you what your church is all about, what are we going to say? Because if we are not about that. Amen. This Friday, 7 p.m., Ladies Bible Study. All ladies are welcome to join as we continue reading. Take heart, God's comfort for anxious thought. That, that is through Zoom. Pam will send out the link. This Saturday, and pray for... No rain on Saturday, all right, because the current report is very disheartening. <laughs> so pray for no rain. But this Saturday is the yard sale from 7 a.m. to 2 p.m. Sorting. Uh, so if you have more items, Thursday 5 to 7, Friday 5 to 7, for, uh, to bring your items in. Uh, we're doing great. People have been doing great, but please bring your stuff in for the yard sale. Uh, if you got any questions, see Rosa. All right. Uh, ladies' Prayer Breakfast Saturday, June 18th at 9 a.m. in the Fellowship Hall. All Elkus ladies are invited to join in. Also, the C.S. Lewis Bible Study is also that June 18th and then at 1.30 p.m. Uh, baby bottles are due back on Father's Day. Remember, for the Catherine Foundation, if you took a baby bottle, filled it with change, it's due back Father's Day, which is June 19th. Father's Day is June 19th. Uh, so bring back those baby bottles at that time. And mark it down, July 11 to 15 is Vacation Bible School, 9.30 a.m. to noon. All right, children, come on up. Come, come on. Here we go. I love it, man. That's good. All right, all right. You are not too old for this, Faithy Bear. You don't need to be talking to your mom. We are in the midst of the worship of our Lord right now. All right. So on the count of three, I thought Hannah Banana was here somewhere. Where's Hannah Banana? Banana, banana. All right. On the count of three, we're going to say, wake up, blue. One, two, three. <laughs> Well, good evening, Blue. Uh, uh, blue. Um, blue. Oh, hi, Pastor. Oh, I love rock. What in the world is up with you? You sound very strange, Blue. I do. Oh, must not have noticed. I just feel so. Oh, oh. <laughs> Seriously, are you, are you okay? Oh, Pastor, I am more than okay. I'm in love. 
In what now? Pastor, you know what in love means. Uh, yeah, sure, but you're way too young to be talking about being in love, young lady. Well, sometimes you just know, Pastor. All right, well, we'll come back to that. What are you looking at on your stage here? Uh, nothing. Let me, let me see what this is. Nothing. No, 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 ah, no. Right. Ah, ah. <laughs> be careful with it. This, this is a rock. It, a rock. This looks like a, a rock. Yes, that is a rock. Now, now, shh, give it back to me. Why are you so distracted by a painted rock? Because it's an awesome rock. An awesome rock? Yes, now give it back. Oh, sorry, here. I was supposed to keep that there. Okay. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Oh, wait, actually, I'm supposed yes, to. Yes, you, you, you had yeah. it right. You're right. Yep, yep. I will in a minute. But, Blue, I have a question for you 37, pink, soccer, Jesus. What, what's wrong with you? I was just throwing out answers to questions and hope one of them might work. Not this question, I don't think so. Oh, okay, then what's your question then? Uh, Kaden, Kaden, look up here at the blue right now. <laughs> You're a bad influence, Mr. Mays. <laughs> Sorry, where am I? <clears throat> Not this question up there. Now, okay, six lines down. You say you were in, oh yeah, you said you were in love before, Blue. I said that, <laughs> oh yeah, no. I said I was above because, you know, I, I fly, so I'm above. Okay, yes, fine. I said I was in love. Well, who are you in love with? Don't you want to know who Blue's in love with? Yeah, yeah who are you in love with, Blue? Um, Jesus? See, it's an answer to your question. Blue. Does anybody believe that this rock has to do with Jesus? No, mm. we don't. Mm. He is the he rock. He is the rock. That's right. That's, that's right. Thank <laughs> you. That, that's a, that, but that. I'm thinking maybe, just maybe, you're actually in love with, with whoever gave you this rock. You have a wee bit of a crush on them. Can I have my rock back, please? Uh-huh, I thought so. So someone you have a crush on gave you this rock, and now you just want to take it with you wherever you go. Well, not everywhere. I don't take it. Well, I can't, I guess. Yes, everywhere. I love that little rock. Blue, let's be careful here. You don't want to love the rock so much that it replaces things that really matter now, do you? Like the boy who gave me the rock? I was actually thinking more along the lines of Jesus. Oh, yeah, well, that could never happen. And, you know, Blue, I've heard that before. You should never say never. Sometimes we can elevate something in our lives so high that we start to love it more than we love God and Jesus. It doesn't have to be a rock either. It can be something living. It's called having an idol. God doesn't want us to worship anything or anyone other than him. Oh. Yes, so we have to be careful not to let that happen. Very careful. You know, Blue... If you really like this boy and you carry around this rock he gave you, well, I know you love Jesus. What if you started taking the Bible with you everywhere you went since he gave that to you and to us? Whoa, I never thought about it that way. Can I have my rock back? Whoa! I just want to put it somewhere safe so I can have my hands free to carry my Bible around. All right, Blue, you can have your rock back. Oh, thank you. Along with some prayer, because I think you need it. Yeah, I think I do, too. Yeah, let's pray. Say, dear God. Dear God. Help us. Help us. Love you most. Love you most. Amen. Amen. Go on back. Go on. You too. Back. Go on back. You can't stay here, so go back. Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, and awesome, and a gracious God. I pray, as always, that this message is a message that you got to have for your people. In the blessed name of Jesus, amen. All right, so <clears throat> on Wednesday evening, I've been answering different questions. I'm going to tell you what happened. It's actually a strange little story. This is what we're going to talk about tonight is something I would never, if you would have asked me, could this have been, this is why it's important that people ask questions. Could this have been a question? that people were legitimately having, I would have said no. Uh, and I was on vacation. And my wife and I went down to Myrtle Beach. And three people within a week that did not talk to each other, that had no communication with each other whatsoever, two of them had the identical question. All right? The third person produced a video, one of our parishioners, produced a video answering these questions but these two people weren't talking to him, not like because in a bad way, just were not in concert with him and probably didn't watch his video. So three times within a week, this same thing came up. 
And it's a thing that I didn't even know was a thing that people could be asking questions about. So I said, all right, I'll do a sermon on this question. But in order to answer it, I want you to open your Bibles to Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. This is the giving of the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. Exodus chapter 20. It's not all the Ten Commandments, obviously, but I just want to read 1 through 6 because the question has to do with verses 1 through 6. Exodus 20, 1 through 6. That's in the Old Testament, Scott. Yeah. <laughs> and God spoke all these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. We're going to stop right there. First thing to note, when Moses wrote the book of Exodus, he did not put, as we all know, I hope we know, verse numbers in chapter numbers, all right? Those were obviously added later for ease purposes for the reader. In addition, as originally written, Hebrew had no punctuation. Did you know that? No indentation. So the indents that you see here are editor's choices. That's not bad. It helps. It assists the reader in reading. Paragraph breaks, chapter divisions, those are not original to the manuscript. Those are editor's choices to assist the American reader. Follow? All right. Having said that, you might not know this. Do you know that we as Christians cannot agree on how to number the Ten Commandments? Uh, we cannot agree on how to number the Ten Commandments. As a matter of fact, the Lutherans and the Catholics, Luther, when he uh, was kicked out of the Roman Catholic Church, did not want to change anything that was not necessary for change. He wanted to keep things as similar as possible, which is why a lot of times when people come to a Lutheran church, they're like, it's kind of Catholic, but the guy is definitely not Catholic. Ah, and that's exactly right, all right? That's kind of why he didn't change things. So he did not change the numbering of the commandments. But the way that Lutherans and Catholics number the commandments the first one is, everybody should know the first commandment, right? What's the first commandment? You, have shall, you shall have no other gods before me. All right. The second commandment is, do not misuse God's name. And the third commandment is, remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. That's how Lutherans and Catholics number the first three commandments. However, if you've ever gone to the Supreme Court, uh, or if you've ever seen the Ten Commandments on public display, chances are that is not what you see. Uh, the pilgrims and uh, uh, the first settlers in the United States of America were from the, what I'll call the Reformed, the, they'll call themselves that, the Reformed tradition. And in the Reformed tradition, they numbered the commandments this way. And this is probably what you see when you see the Ten Commandments publicly displayed. You see it, you shall have no other gods. So first one agreed, but they make their number two, you shall not make a graven image. And then the number three is do not misuse God's name. And the number four is remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Now, what they'll say, which is untrue, is that the Roman Catholic Church took out you shall not make a graven image because of all their iconography. All right? That's what they'll say. But having said this, do you know that the Jews, they had the commandments before us, didn't they? They numbered the commandments differently than both of them. The Jews begin not with a command, but with a statement. Exodus 20 begins by saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, out of bondage. The Hebrew word that we are translating commandment is actually the Hebrew word devar, which simply is the word for word. Uh, it's simply the ten words from God. 
Now, I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I think the Jews are right. I think the Jews were right, and I don't think we should have messed with it at all. Because what happens with the Lutherans and the Catholics is we divide 9 and 10 up. doesn't make a lot of sense. But what the Reformed people do makes just as little sense. Because a graven image is what? A, an idol. All right? And this little difference you're about to see is making a cataclysmic, apparently, problem with a lot of people's faith. The first commandment, according to the Jews, is I am the Lord your God who brought you out of bondage. Basically, God is identifying, I'm God, I delivered you. Therefore, so he's self-identifying himself as your God who delivered you. Therefore, you shall have no other gods, is their second commandment. And their third is, you shall not misuse God's name. That's how the Jews number the first three commandments. So we've got the Lutherans and the Catholics over there on the left. In the middle, we've got the Protestant uh, the reform, out of the Reformed tradition. And on the right, you've got the Jews. I've already showed my hand that I think the way the Jews do it is actually appropriate. But I'm just Chris. Uh, so I'm not going to rewrite the catechism anytime. Uh, and so I teach them according to the Lutheran numbering. Um, having said that, it makes perfect sense. See, we had to get to 10. But what happened was we said, I'm the Lord your God who brought you out of bondage is not what? It's not a command. And the word isn't command. The word is words. The 10 words from God. All right? Uh, and so that's why they eliminated that. All right. So here's the formulation of the question that I received. That's, now I want you to put that knowledge over here on a shelf. Put that Tuck that away. We're going to get back to that, all right? So tuck that away. It's going, to, it's going to resonate in a little bit. But tuck that knowledge here. So I got this question. If the second commandment says, you shall not make a graven image of anything in heaven above or on earth below, why aren't shows like The Chosen? Do you know what The Chosen is, by the way? It's a very uh, well-known uh, show about Jesus Christ today. Why aren't shows like The Chosen a violation of that command since it creates an image of Jesus? Furthermore, we have stained glass windows. We got a bunch of them now uh, with Jesus on them. Children's Sunday school pages with image of Jesus, etc. Why isn't this a violation? Never heard this question before. But basically, hey, we've got all these passion plays uh, where Jesus shows up. And God condemns making an image of him. So how is that Okay. How is it okay to have stained glass windows? How is it okay to have, because we got an image, we got images of, I think we are in a very multicultural congregation. We got black Jesus, we got Hispanic Jesus, and we got winter Jesus rising from the dead right there, all right? So we got a multicultural, we got Jesus all different ways, all right? So then here's that, there's that question. How can we put these images of Jesus when these are clearly not Jesus, and the second commandment says, you shall not make a graven image of Jesus or of anything else. So, in addition to this, so I get this question before I leave on vacation. Then, in vacation, a wonderful, sainted, saintly woman of God, wonderful woman of God, emails me in kind of a distress email. And she says, I'm going to try and introduce my daughter to the chosen um, but then I just, I watched this video and are we really violating the commands because we are watching these shows like this, stained glass windows, uh, and, and things like this Did I, am I participating in idolatry? And I watched this video and I'll tell you the thing that was the most disturbing about this video. It had a hundred thousand views. That was the most disturbing thing about the video because a hundred thousand people have been infected with garbage. Uh, I mean, honestly, I'm just going to, honestly. So it was very, very sad. I was like, man, Elkus gets like 20 views. <laughs> uh, this guy's got 100,000 views. And then uh, a, a good friend of mine, a parishioner, made a video about this question. Because apparently this video is going viral and causing disturbances. And then a very popular well-known, steeped in the scripture, 
reformed theologian that I respect came out and agreed. And I was like, oh my goodness. Apparently, this must be answered. Because I got to tell you, I love going to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. And whenever Jesus shows up, I cry like a baby. Uh, I love the stained glass windows. I'm going to watch The Chosen, uh, season three, when it comes out. I love The Passion of the Christ. Uh, and I don't have any qualms of conscience about our windows whatsoever. And when my children draw little pictures of Jesus, I do not think they're violating the second commandment. So, okay. What's going on here? So, how can I say if the Bible directly says, and the second commandment is numbered by the reform, clearly says, don't make an image of God. Stop. There's their first mistake. You know, Jesus, uh, God, when he gives the commandments, never actually says, don't make an image of God. You know that? Look what it actually says. If they're going to read it the way they say we're supposed to read it, look what it says. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the sea. First off, I, I do think that would include God. But the command is not, don't make for yourself a carved image of God. What does it actually say? If you're going to be literal like this, what does it say? Of anything in heaven or earth or in the sea. So apparently, all picture art entirely is idolatry because that's what it says. You can't make a sculpture of anything in heaven. You can't make a sculpture of anything on earth. You can't, you can't. When you draw a picture of a sunset, you'd be an idolater according to this. If you're taking it that way. Which I think is a really silly way to take it. But that's what it says, doesn't it? In addition, God messed up hardcore. Because as soon as he gives this command, he tells Moses and the Israelites to make this beautiful, ornate box. I'll call it, well, he called it, the ark. Where he would put it inside the Holy of Holies in the tabernacle with a big veil in front of it. And do you know what he told them to carve out of gopher wood and overlay with gold and slap on top of the ark? Two cherubim angels. He told them to make two angels and put it on top of the ark. That would be a direct violation of what God specifically said, don't do. He's like Alzheimer's God. He says, don't make an image of anything in heaven. And then he turns around and he has the people of Israel make an image of angels in heaven. And slap it on top of the ark. And he says, I'm going to be reside in the mercy seat. Huh. To make matters worse, when they wandered in the wilderness, God sent a plague because the Israelites were complaining in Numbers 21, saying, oh, why can't we go back to Egypt? And God sent serpents and bit them all, and they were dying, and they cried out to God. And Moses was commanded by the Lord. To formulate a bronze serpent around a staff. And they were told to look at the bronze serpent that he had fashioned. And if they looked at the serpent, they would be healed. Jesus himself in John 3 in his conversation with Nicodemus even quotes this event. In John 3 he says, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness... So must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus himself highlights the crafted, graven image of the serpent lifted up in the desert and likens it to who? Himself. And says, I'm that serpent. Fast forward to the New Testament. Look at Luke 3, 21 and 22, and Colossians 1, 15. 
Now, when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also has been baptized and was praying, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove. And a voice came from heaven, you are my beloved son, with you I am well pleased. The scripture is the inerrant, inspired, infallible word of God. Can we agree on that? And apparently Luke wanted us to liken the Holy Spirit's descent to what? He gave us what? The image. He gave us the image. And then Colossians 1.15, speaking of Jesus, he, the he here is Jesus, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. You know how you don't really have a formulated image in your head of God the Father? You don't. But you have an image of Jesus, don't you? That's because he is the image of God. When God wants you to think about God, guess who he wants you to think about? Jesus. Jesus took on human flesh. Jesus is the image of the invisible God. You're supposed to image Jesus. You're called to image Jesus. One last thing before I move. Sin doesn't exist simply externally, meaning thinking about sleeping with another woman, that's lust. That's not your wife. That's lust, and that's akin to adultery. Didn't Jesus say that? Isn't coveting? It's, it's in the list. Coveting. Where does coveting exist? In the heart and in the mind. The Bible has always made it clear that sin is not simply some external act, but it is the desires, the passions of the heart and the mind. Can we agree on that? When you read a story, if it was wrong, if it was sinful to imagine, to image Jesus, well then putting him on a window is just the outward representation of what's already happening where? Inside of you. So when you read the story of Jesus healing a leper, if you have an image of a guy healing a leper, sin, 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 sin. So apparently every time you read of Jesus, because when you read narrative, don't you image the narrative in your head? Sinner. Because if you put it in your head... It's a sin. So if simply having an image of Jesus in your head was a sin or on a window was a sin, you would be sinning every time you read the Bible. Do you follow? The reason I'm irritated is because it's irritable. I was telling somebody earlier, it bothers me that I have to give the sermon. Because it's so ludicrous so let's talk about what it actually means so what does the warning against graven image that is indeed clearly in the scriptures forbid here is verse 4 of exodus 20 you shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth thank goodness there's a verse 5 because he's not condemning art all right Verse 5 and 6, you shall not bow down to them. Oh, now we're getting to it. Or to serve them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers and the children of the third and fourth generations of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. The problem, when Aaron threw all the people's gold in the fire and out popped the calf, uh, if you recall, was not that he made an image out of gold of a cow. That was not the sin. What was the sin? This is your God who brought you out of Egypt. They bowed down to the image. The image was their God. The image isn't the problem. The problem is believing the image is what? Raise your hand if you watch The Passion of the Christ. I know I did. Okay. It's great. It's an amazing film. Anyway, Jim Caviezel is the actor that played Jesus in The Passion of the Christ. He went on and played different parts in different films. One of them, I didn't see the movie. It was a trailer. It was a motorboat trailer. Like, he was in a movie with motorboats. When you saw Jim Caviezel in the motorboat trailer, were you like, I didn't know Jesus drove motorboats. It's 
so awesome that Jesus drove motorboats. It's amazing. Or were you able to say, Jim is an actor who played Jesus, and now he's in a motorboat. Were you able to do that? Congratulations, you are sane. Ah, uh, that's because that's what you were able to do. All right? I don't think you worshiped and bowed down. As a matter of fact, if I ever caught people worshiping those windows, praying to those windows as if they were God, I'd be the first to smash them. Uh, <laughs> maybe both. Uh, art is a beautiful thing. It's an amazing gift that God has given us. It tells a story. I can see creation, redemption. I can see the coming of the Holy Spirit. I can see Jesus as a good shepherd. I can see the Trinity. I can see the cross of Christ. I can see that he's knocking on the door. There is not one part of me that says, is that the real Jesus? No, it's art, and art is a beautiful thing. Not to mention, do you wear a cross necklace? Guess what that is? That's an image of something on earth. When do you get in trouble? And by the way, this trouble does exist. When you get in trouble is when you start kissing the statue of the Virgin Mary because her eyes are bleeding. When you actually begin to worship the statue, there are a billion Hindus in this world that are doing just that, worshiping the statue. So that does exist. It absolutely does exist. That's the problem. But as is typical, some Christians that are pharisaical, if somebody misuses a gift, they'll say we can't do what? Have the gift at all. It's the worst kind of person. It's the former alcoholic that can't stand that anybody can enjoy a drink. And that's what's going on. <clears throat> Idolatry is not simply our worship of images. That's another thing that they've made silly. And, and where this has come from is the way that they messed up numbering up the commandments. They felt forced to make a distinction between you shall have no other gods and you can't make an image. You follow? They were forced to say, what's the difference between regular idolatry and now image idolatry? When the graven image part is simply defining for us what it would look like to have what? Another God. That's why I want you to take this off the shelf. And what you find out is this is all coming from us messing with the way they had it. That's where all this is coming from. Luther does a wonderful job describing the large catechism, what an idol is. And this is what he writes. To have a God is nothing else than to trust and believe him from the whole heart. As I have often said, that the confidence and the faith of the heart alone make both God and an idol. If your faith and trust be right, then is your God also true. And on the other hand, if your trust be false and wrong, then you have not the true God. For these two belong together, both faith and God. That now I say, upon which you set your heart and put your trust is properly your God. What happens is people say, oh, I'm going to smash my stained glass windows. I'm going to smash. I refuse to watch The Chosen. I won't go to Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I won't let my little kids have their Sunday school. And all of a sudden, you turn into little tiny Pharisees that think that you fulfilled the commandment by doing that, when in reality, idolatry is a thing of the heart where you trust and you cling. So you begin to trust and cling to your own ridiculous self-righteousness. And it, that becomes idolatry. Luther said it best. Whatever your heart trusts or clings to, I say that is your God. It can be money. It can be your husband. It can be your wife. It can be your children. It can be yourself. Far more dangerous is the heart of man than a stained glass window. <clears throat> and it all stems... From a misnumbering. The last thing I already mentioned is 
Just because some folks mess up a gift doesn't mean we can't use the gift. I think that's very, very important to understand. Just because there are alcoholics doesn't mean we can't drink responsibly. Just because there are adulterers doesn't mean we can't enjoy sex within marriage. Just because some people worship art doesn't mean we can't use art to enhance our worship of the true God. Amen. Amen. May God be praised. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, an awesome, and a gracious God. We love you. We honor you. We glorify you as our God and as our King. Father, I pray that we would never be steeped in vain idolatry, but instead we would worship you as the true and only God. In the name of Jesus, amen. The plates are in the back if you'd like to donate uh, for tithes and offerings. Or, of course, you can go online to lcoos.org. Let us continue with the prayers. Let's bow our heads. O oh Jesus, our Savior from sin, keep us from building our hopes on this earthly life with its sin and sorrows, its shallow pleasures, and its imperfect treasures. Father, give each of us an earnest longing for that day when we shall be with you, which is far better. In the midst of the troubles and uncertainties of this life, let not our hearts be filled with fearfulness and anxiety, but give us a calm trust that calls on you for help in every time of need. Having placed all in your hands, ourselves, our troubles, our cares, our needs, our fears, our failures, our sins, our very futures, give us the strength and courage to go on and meet one by one the battles of life, never doubting you will make everything turn out for our good. Trusting in you, O oh Lord, we ask you to save us from all our foes who oppress us and from all things that afflict us. As long as we are earthbound, waiting for the blessed hour of our final redemption, supply us with the Holy Spirit and his grace that we may adorn our life of good works, giving ample proof of our faith and of the love we have for you. While we journey here as pilgrims and strangers in a world hostile to you and our faith, guard and keep us safe from all evil that may threaten our bodies and souls. Keep us each step of the way, lest we yield to temptation. While of necessity we must be involved in earthly tasks and labors, let us not neglect our higher calling as laborers in our Heavenly Father's vineyard, proclaiming repentance and remission of sins to others. Take care of all of our needs, but especially forgive our sins. Do not count them against us on that final day when all must appear before your throne of judgment. Grant that having trusted in you to the end, we will be found acceptable, clothed in the righteousness that have merited for us. And that day, give each of us a crown of glory to wear forever in heaven. Father, we pray for the circuited outreach. We pray for our instrumentalists and their needs. In particular, we pray for a drummer. We pray for the special needs of Mary, the Williams family, Rebecca, Lynn Wells and her knee, Lizette, Alexis, Barbara, Rick, Doris, Saifu, Eudora, James, Jennifer, Joel, Matina, Jim and Rosa, VJ Maria, Chris and Beth, Nick and Arnie, Gabriel and Jalissa, Marcus and Deanna, Adrian, Olivia, Antonio and Carmen, Ivan and Luce and Nathaniel. Heal, Carlos, Kathy, Patricia, Crystal, Kara, Buffy, Kathy, Patty, Billy, Larry, Jackie, Eugene, Francis, Gail, James, Carmen, Antonio, Soberio, Dorothy, Odette, Elsa, Nancy Love, Chrissy, Catherine, Grace, Kathy Kelly, Paul and Leah, Bobby and Connie, Elsa, Dorothy, George, Diane, Nancy, Carol, and Sydney. Bring healing to them, Father God. Turn Oliver, Eric, Leo, Marianne, Brian, Tom, Dave, Chuck, Linda, Whitney, Heather, Justin, Lonnie, and Chris, Matina, Jackie, Jamila, Janine, Joey, Joey, Ryan, Hector, Wilfredo, Rafael, Rodriguez, Cindy, Johnny. Turn them to you for salvation. For the families of Bill, Skip, and Lotson, turn them to you, Jesus, the cross and the empty tomb, for comfort and bereavement in the midst of their loss. For the President of the United States, the Congress, and the Judiciary, bless them and view them with wisdom. For the Governor, State Legislators, and Local County Commissioners, bless them. For our soldiers, our sailors, our airmen, Marines, and Coast Guardsmen, 
civilian forces around the globe to the firemen, the EMS, the EMT. Bless them. May they act justly and love mercy and walk humbly with you. Jesus, you testified in this sinful world and you make an amazing promise. You say, I am coming soon. We, your people, look up toward heaven with a smile on our faces. We respond with a simple prayer. Amen. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We look forward to the day when the sky rolls back as a scroll, the moon, the blood, and the sun of darkness. Because on that day, we rise again and live forever lasting with you and everlasting blessedness and peace. But if you, Terry, I do pray that we live authentic lives of Christian love. That we love our enemies, do good to those who hate us, bless those who curse us, pray for those who mistreat us, and in this way show the true love of God to a hurting world. Hear us, Father, as we pray the prayer you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. You may be seated. This is the second Wednesday of the month. I thought it was the first Wednesday of the month, so I set up a communion. So guess what? We get the body and blood of our Lord tonight. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Yeah, we'll do a continuous line, yeah. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it, giving it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, also after supper, he took the cup, he gave it to his disciples, and he said, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the new covenant of my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
Please rise. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. So we 